Ukraine is in turmoil as Citigroup tries to deal with fraud. You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show. I'm Matt Kopenheffer. This is David Hansen. We're back in the studio, back to some sense of normalcy here after another snowstorm. Yesterday, that was a depressing intro, by the way. Ukraine in turmoil, Citigroup fraud. Tell well, me that's something good. Here's a, <laughs> actually, no, this one's kind of, depending on how you look at it, this is kind of depressing too. Radio Shack struggling, closing, I think it was 1,100 stores. Mm -hmm. When is the last time you shopped in a Radio Shack and what did you buy? 2007, bought some random cable I needed to hook up some stereo. That's, uh, mine was more recent. It was probably 2013. I think it was mm. sometime in 2013, but it was just, it was a small, like, $3 cable. Exactly. I guess, I guess people shopping in Radio Shack, at, oh no, no, I bought, a, I bought a battery for something too. Um, so I guess people shopping every car. couple years for a battery toy or car cable battery. Doesn't, yeah. doesn't keep a, a business running. Let's go to the first headline. First headline of the day, we're going to the Wall Street Journal. Putin, Russia reserves right for force in Ukraine. David, we're not a political or geopolitical show here. So the real question is, what impact has the situation in Ukraine had on your investing? None so far, but maybe it will in the future. And you hear some people saying this could be the start of World War III, right? That's, you hear that. I've, I've heard it. We also heard that last year when the whole Cyprus bailout crisis, banking crisis was happening. So it's really easy to make predictions about what's going to trigger something much larger and kind of blow up the whole world. Mm -hmm. But look what happened with Cyprus. We don't even talk about that anymore. And it's kind of just a footnote in terms of what happened in, even in 2013. So I'm kind of just stepping back. I don't really know the situation too well and I'm not letting it impact me. What about you? Well. I mean, just just to be honest, I, I'm not I'm not really paying a lot of attention to it from an investing standpoint. We talk here a lot about circle of competence. This is not in my circle of competence in terms of a being able to analyze what's going on, b being able to try to figure out what's going to happen, and then c connect that back yeah. to my investing. What what I focus on is trying to analyze businesses. That's what that's what I love to do. That's what I feel like I'm pretty decent at. As far as figuring out when the, the turmoil of, of different countries' relations are gonna turn into outright war, that is way outside my comfort zone. So trying to base investment decisions on that is going to be a terrible idea. Yes. I think may, maybe there are some people out there who are interested in investing and are also experts in geopolitics. And maybe, they, maybe they're not as good at analyzing businesses or don't focus as much on analyzing businesses as I do. So they may want to direct their investments based on that knowledge that they have. Mm -hmm. I don't have it. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I leave this situation in, from an investing standpoint. Favorite Ukrainian food dish? <laughs> what are you talking about? Do you have do you, one? Do you have one? I have no idea what they eat. I've Ukraine. never eaten. I've never eaten. Imagine Ukraine. sausage. Although when I, when, when, I was in, when I was in high school, way back when, when I was in high school, I, I did a trip to a wrestling camp at the Belarusian training center. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't really repeat what we ate there, <laughs> but let me just say it was not terribly pleasant. I can imagine. It was a training center, though. It wasn't. It wasn't designed to please That's, the taste buds. Of course, and wrestlers. So, yeah. <laughs> Come on. All right. Second headline: Staying over at the Wall Street Journal, Citigroup, U.S. sought information from Mexico unit. We talked about this last week. Citigroup, I guess you could say they were allegedly the victims of some fraud here. Sure. Uh, had to go back and revise their 2013. Allegedly. Earnings. Allegedly. Allegedly. I said alleged. Allegedly. I don't think you though. said allegedly. I did. We'll roll back the tape. Okay. Um, had to revise their 2013 earnings downward. You've got some thoughts about this. You're pretty passionate about it. You were telling me before the show. <laughs> you don't think this is a big deal. It's not that I don't think it's a big deal. Anytime you lose hundreds of millions of dollars, whether it be fraud or whether it be... Just uh, messing up. You're just messing up. Either way, it's, it's bad news. The problem that I have is that I think too many people are jumping on this and using this one data point to create a story. Mm -hmm. And it's not surprising because that's what humans do. We make stories, we're, we're good at it. it, helps us live better in a lot of ways, but in investing, it can often lead us astray. And so taking this one instance and saying, oh, well this shows that Citigroup and its, and its global uh, it, it's, it's global reach, mm -hmm. the fact that it's in different countries, emerging markets, it's gonna be subject to this kind of fraud. 
they're not ready for this kind of thing. They're not managing this well. And this is all from this one instance. They're not connecting it up to anything else. Meanwhile, we just talked about Buffett's shareholder letter yesterday. And in that letter, Buffett talked about investing $2 billion in bonds of energy futures holdings. This, yep. was, this was back in, again, I think it was 2007. One of the largest, or maybe at the time, it was the largest leveraged buyout deal. And they lost a lot. Yeah. Fifty percent? Yes. Uh, so Energy Futures Holdings is almost going to go bankrupt now. And Buffett's lost about 50 percent, $800 million on that. People aren't taking that and, and creating the story, oh, well, Buffett doesn't know what he's doing. He, he can't invest in fixed income. This is terrible. So it's kind of a, I mean, granted, Buffett's earned that, that, they don't, that that story doesn't go off. Citigroup hasn't done that. In fact, it's done that's, the opposite. That, I think that's the point. Yes, the fraud is not a reason to not invest in Citigroup. I don't think fraud is going to be prevalent around every single country that they're in. But like you said, they haven't earned the right to say that this is going to be an isolated incident. I, again, I don't think it's going to be fraud everywhere. But what have we learned from Citigroup in terms of well, I, I, I think manage risk I, appropriately around the world? We don't. But, have, we but what, what I'm saying is that it's not necessarily. I'm not necessarily saying that you see this and it's oh, it's a good thing. Right. But I'm not. But I'm saying you don't necessarily see this and say, "Oh, it's it's a bad thing. It proves something." It, it doesn't is prove just, anything. It's a data point. It's a data point. It doesn't it. prove anything, but it doesn't help the case. The saying that they have well, it never helps the them. case when you lose a few hundred million dollars. Okay, I'll, I'm am sticking to my original argument that we. Have I I ago, didn't that figure that you'd change it. It doesn't make me. It doesn't make me feel any better. Obviously, about their international stuff. I guess you just are fine with it. You think they're on the right path. Uh, it's 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 something to monitor, but. It doesn't. It doesn't change my view. It, it doesn't. This one data point. If we start seeing this cropping up, you meanwhile, you can go on being a master storyteller. All right, monitor away. <laughs> Third headline. Third headline. We are going to CNN money. Ninety-five percent of bank ATMs face end of security support. Right on the tails of the the whole Target debacle. Now they're talking about what this headline refers to is ninety-five percent of ATMs in the U.S. are on Windows XP. Mm -hmm. Microsoft is getting ready to end security and support for Windows XP. I think they said April 8th is when that yeah. ends. So the banks are going to be responsible for, or, or are going to need to, upgrade all of these ATMs. And, and in, the, in the CNN Money article, they're talking about their 200,000 ATMs that would need to be upgraded. They cost, it, it could cost between 1,000 and 3,500 per ATM, mm -hmm. according to estimates, to do those upgrades. That's pretty significant. But, but I'm not sure it's as significant as the numbers might. I mean, they, they sound like such big numbers, but you put them all together, you're talking about $600 million or so, yeah. depending on how you, which side of the estimates you go on. Spread that over all the banks. I don't know, maybe it's just that we're insensitive now because we've heard After all the these billions. billion right. dollars the, settlements. The amount, the amount is not huge, but I think it, going back to Buffett, we're talking about Buffett a lot this week, just to let everyone Make, know. Makes In sense. the letter, he talked about uh, depreciation and how so many people look at EBITDA and say, well, let's not include depreciation. This, it is an expense for businesses. Mm. In his letter, he called out software expenses and how technology improves and you have to get better technology and that's an actual expense for the business. Mm -hmm. This is an example of sure. that. You can't just say, oh, the ATMs, depreciation, it doesn't matter, it's not a real expense. Uh -huh. You're seeing the real expense that they have to upgrade their software and it's gonna take a hit. It's not gonna be a big deal, but it just shows you that you can't just write off all those no, that's, like that. that's true, that's true. The cost of upgrading, though, will be far less than the costs that will be borne out if, if somebody, some hacker figures out how to break in because of some uh, Windows yeah. XP security hole. They'll update it. Your money's fine. I'm pretty confident of that. My money? What about everybody else's? Just yours. All right, Especially let's go to the, the focus for today. It is Tuesday. We've started doing a Tuesday stock pitch. David, your, your last week's Sounded good. Stock on a radar. Didn't stock on a radar. Stock on the radar. It, it, a, pitch. a pitch is a pitch. I'm pitching it to put on your radar. Okay, fine. fine. There you go. Uh, what do you What do you have this week? You, you wouldn't even tell me before the show, so I'm going to be completely so you surprised can by this. Some with some questions here. <laughs> <laughs> Going with uh, Oak Tree Capital, oh. and this is the investment manager run by famed investor Howard Marks. Howard Marks here. It's a nine billion dollar company, nine billion dollar market cap. Um, they focus on the fixed income market. So we usually talk about stock investing here. Mm -hmm. They focus on fixed income, uh, junk bonds or 
high yield bonds, uh, distressed debt. It's kind of their. That reminds sweet me spot. of a quote. There's, there's, sorry, there's a quote from Wedding Singer. Where one, the one guy is a is a junk bond yep. trader. Too. <laughs> I don't call what you do junk waitressing. Exactly. <laughs> high yield. High yield. Not quite Love junk. That. There. Great movie. Uh, sorry, continue. So I think I think the fund was started in '94. Uh, it just went public in 2012. Okay. Um, $84 billion under management there, and they make their fees, like most investment managers make their fees, they have management fees, kind of overall assets under management, charge a fee for that, and then mm -hmm. they have incentive fees for when they clear their hurdle, then they start to get even more uh, fees so, for the business. So I gotta ask you right up front, why a fixed income asset manager right now? It seems like a bad gonna, time. It does seem like a bad time. Uh, Yields obviously very very low, um, and, and there's been some thought in terms of should Oak Tree lower their kind of hurdle rate in, mm -hmm. in such a low environment. And they've said no, we're sticking with our traditional hurdle rates, eight to ten percent. Mm -hmm. We still think we can achieve those returns for our shareholders. This is somewhat of a, I don't want to say this because it's like such a typical slogan. It's a somewhat of a counter cyclical investment here. Okay. Um, in 2009, when most private equity companies in 2008 were running for the hills in terrible condition, Oak Tree was out there raising enormous amounts of capital and putting it to work at the best time. So they kind of were waiting on the sidelines in 2006, 2007. They weren't raising a lot of capital. They didn't see the opportunity. 2009 happened, a lot of distressed debt. Mm -hmm. They came in, made some great deals there. So you can argue that maybe it's not looking great today, but if there's going to be someone who's going to take advantage of a next credit cycle, mm -hmm. it's going to be them, and they have the ability to raise capital kind of at the drop of a hat here. How big of a role does Howard Marks play at the company, and how much of an impact does that have on your investment thesis? He plays a big role. He's still the biggest individual shareholder, and one of the concerns when it went public was, why would I buy a company that Howard, Howard Marks, Marks is, yeah. is selling? But he still owns, I think, around 13% of the company, so he's still a huge shareholder here. It does play into my consideration here. He's not a young guy, but he's not 83 like Warren Buffett. And as we've seen with Warren Buffett, investors don't get worse as they get older. They usually get better. Mm -hmm. Between 50 and 70, maybe line. 80 percent, uh, or not 80 years old, they can get even better. So he's been an amazing investor so far, and he does play a big role. I don't see him stepping away from this. This has been kind of his life's work here with this fund. So uh, it's definitely a risk if he was to leave, but I don't see that, that happening. Maybe he reduces his, his stake in the company just to gain some liquidity from the situation. But okay, so how about, how about valuation right now? How does the valuation look? I don't think it looks dirt cheap, but it certainly doesn't look expensive. And it's, this is one of those businesses that's a little bit hard to value because you look at assets under management, you kind of project where that grows in the future. But the difficult thing is the incentive fees, which in 2013 was their biggest portion because it depends on the actual performance of the fund. So historically, so in, in 2013, the funds actually performed, because 2013 was a tough time to be mm -hmm. investing in fixed income. Right. It, it, was a, it was a difficult market. And so they, they actually outperformed and earned significant. Uh, right. Is that, okay. Yes. Um, and historically, the funds have produced, I think, 19% annualized returns. I don't expect that going forward because it is such a bigger fund now. Mm -hmm. But if they can still get 11, 10% a year, they can make good incentive fees. And based on the valuation day, I think it can be attractive. So you're saying it's probably fairly priced. I think it's probably fairly priced, and because of the structure of the company being a, a partnership, you get the, the dividends passed through to you. You can expect around 6% yield. That'll change based on so the performance. So it's paying a 6% yield right, right, right. now. Right, okay. and that's, that's probably the normal. I, sometimes it'll, be, it'll look a lot more because if they'll have one great year or quarter or so, um, but you can probably expect around 6%. Anything else we prices. should know? The income statement and kind of the filings are confusing, mm. to say the least, because of the structure, because of kind of how they structure the shares. Similar to some of the uh, PE shops that went. Right. Okay. And they have a consolidated income statement where they have to include the actual fund's performance, even though it's not really direct to shareholders. Mm -hmm. So they call out a separate thing called the segmented financial data. That's what you want to pay attention to, not necessarily the consolidated, because the consolidated, you'll look at it and say, what the heck? Has been. They made $3 billion, it's a $9 billion company, this doesn't make any sense. But you have to go down to the segment of financial data and that'll be a little bit clearer. Still a little bit confusing, so you have to pay attention here. Okay. And for, for listeners and viewers who aren't as familiar with Howard Marks, he of course wrote the book, uh, The Most Important Thing, yep. and those letters that he writes for Oak Tree Capital mm -hmm. are great, great reads. And the ticker is OAK. That makes sense. It is. All right, going to the mailbag, uh, we have an email address, it's WTMI at fool.com. 
we love to get emails and someday, as we keep discussing, we'll have a mailbag to put those in. But for now, let's go to Del Clark. Del Clark writes, two months ago on the December 3rd episode of Where the Money Is, I love calling out way back to December, you played a round of Would You Rather and asked whether you would rather own AGNC or drink sour milk. David went with AGNC, but Matt said he would rather drink sour milk. So now, two months later, AGNC is up 14%. With all due respect, what say ye now, Mr. Copenheffer? First of all, I will point out that when most people say, with all due respect, they usually don't mean it. I don't <laughs> believe that's the case with, with uh, Del Clark. Uh, I think he does. It's kind of one of those primers where you say it and then you say the exact opposite. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in any case, the first thing I'll point out is that the two-month performance of, um, of AGNC, of, of American Capital Agency, that's not really what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. That's not what we were referring to. That's not what we talk about on this show. So uh, the performance over any given time period, any particularly a short time period, what we're really thinking about is how's the management, uh, how's this company run, what's the business, all this kind of stuff, and how is that going to play out over the course of five years? And sure, that's convenient for me because I can say anything today and say, okay, we'll wait five yeah. years. Uh, but that's what makes this a little bit difficult um, because we're talking about businesses and the stock market and the stock market plays out and does whatever it mm -hmm. wants on a day-to-day -day basis, blah, blah, blah. The other thing that I'll say is that the, the outcome is not necessarily uh, indicative of, of whether I was right or wrong at the time of, of, of figuring it out. So it's this whole process and outcome thing which we've talked, to, talked about bun a bunch on this show before that you want to have the right process, you want to have the right analysis going in. Um, if you do that, your outcomes will take care of themselves most of the time, yeah. or, or a lot of the time, or a high percentage of mm -hmm. the time. Um, you don't want to look at what your outcome was and then try to backtrack and figure out, well, what did I do? Because that was mm -hmm. obviously right. Finally, I will point out, after I've said all of that and, and, and talked that about how said. that being said, uh, <laughs> we don't care about short-term performance. However, Heather, let's see the chart here. This is, of course, American Capital Agency versus my favorite mortgage REIT, Two Harbors. Uh, this is a total return, Two Harbors beating out American Capital Agency over that time period. Not by much. And it's, and it's fair to say AGNC versus drinking sour milk probably would have preferred owning AGNC over Are you still sticking period. with the sour milk today, though? Would I rather drink sour milk today than AGNC? Yeah, probably. I, I'm, I'm actually, you know, what, you know what, I'm not just saying that, I'm actually thinking about it literally. Would I rather invest my money there or drink a glass of sour milk? And I think I'd rather do that. And, and I don't mean, and here I go, I don't mean disrespect to the team over at American Capital Agency, mm -hmm. but I'd rather invest my money elsewhere and if drinking a, a glass of sour milk is the cost of that, I will do that because I want a portfolio that I feel good with and understand. All right, making a note of that. Get you some sour milk. I'm, I'm going to I'm I'm give you $100, and then I'm going to give you a sour milk and say you can either take the $100, put it in agency, or drink the sour milk. It's so if I drink the sour milk, do I get the $100 and I can invest it in whatever I want? Nope. That's, that's a stupid game. Speaking of the game. Speaking of the game. Let's go to the you game. Rather. Game for today, it is a little would you rather. Speaking of would you rather, uh, we've got two scenarios. It's easy, pick which one you'd rather do. Let's see the first scenario. David, would you rather own the Berkshire stock portfolio or the Berkshire operating businesses? So separating these two, you can't get both. Mm -hmm. You can either be a, what, what do you want to do, 100% ownership? Still 100% ownership. Sure. I'm going with the operating businesses here. Mm -hmm. I alluded to this a little bit yesterday in terms of the competitive advantage that the operating businesses have. Yes, the stock portfolio has an advantage. It's clearly done well over time. But the operating businesses, Buffett was talking about how the energy business is getting into solar, getting into wind energy. They have so many different things they can get into. That's in, why you in want energy. to own the operating business because of the solar. No, I, I'm, saying, I'm saying they have such great opportunity <laughs> to expand into different markets and can really grow, uh, kind of book that way. So 
What do you think? I want to disagree with you, but I'm going to have to agree. I'm going with the operating businesses. The If we separate it into three buckets, you've got the, the capital intensive businesses, the manufacturing and the utilities, you've got the insurance companies, and you've got the uh, retail and, and manufacturing. I may have mixed up some of those. Uh, but anyway, the insurance, such a central part of this business, and between Ajit Jain uh, running the, uh, the big reinsurance, mm-hmm. the catastrophe reinsurance business, and Geico, you have just such powerhouses there. Mm-hmm. These are two powerhouses uh, producing a lot of float for the business to then reinvest. Uh, that's what makes the stock portfolio so valuable to Berkshire Hathaway because it's able to invest on the float. Yeah. I'd much rather own these operating businesses. And I mean, I mean there, there's so many businesses that Berkshire owns that nobody even really knows about yeah. necessarily. Fruit of the Loom, Dairy Queen, Brooks Running Shoes. I mean, this is all stuff Heinz. that's owned by Berkshire. Heinz, yeah. partially. Partially. All right, let's go to the second scenario. Second scenario, sticking with the Buffett theme. Would you rather have Warren Buffett or Brian Moynihan run Bank of America? What do you think? This is, you came up with this question? Yeah. This is a really, this is an easy question. Did you mean for this to be It's Warren Buffett. Okay. Why? Why, would you, why would you not want Warren Buffett to run Bank of America? He's not a banker. You always say you want a banker running. That's one of your lo- slogans. It, it is. It is one. But he's, he, okay, so he's not, he's not a banker. That's a good point. You called me out. Fair enough, but he's a he's a um, knows a lot about banks and the banking industry. Mm-hmm. He's a great capital allocator, and within a bank, what is it but a capital allocation exercise? You, you're figuring out where capital is is best going to go, and then among his lieutenants, he could have bankers. He could have bankers that are then monitoring the operations and stuff like that. I, I guess when I say that. My concern more is when you have a trader yeah. or when you have a, and I don't mean like a Benedict Arnold kind of trader. That would be even worse. <laughs> that would but be like, a, but like a, a stock type trader. So when you have a trader at the top, an investment banker at the top, uh, running a commercial bank, I don't know that that's as appropriate. It makes me feel as good. How about I'm, you? I'm going with Buffett as well. And like you mentioned with the capital allocation, you don't have to have like a great stream of non-interest revenue or anything if you have Buffett at the helm, because he can look at his own stock price he could say, should we buy back shares today? Should we give a dividend? How should we allocate this to the businesses? So you, I don't think you have to have an amazing business model to be successful with Buffett. You probably have to have a pretty good business model. I think Bank of America does with Brian Moynihan, so they can probably be okay. But also Brian right. Moynihan, amazing. <laughs> All right, let's finish, off, let's finish off in the Twitter sphere. David, what is our first tweet? First tweet is from Jason Oxman. He says, a digital wallet that works almost everywhere. It links out to an article on Recode from Walt. Mossberg, and this is a new company or a new concept called Loop, Loop Wallet, and it's essentially an app that you attach to your phone, you swipe all your credit cards in, and then you just touch your credit card to existing credit card terminals. Because okay. one of the problems with NFC, near field communication, has been that merchants don't want to make the investment in getting new technology for credit card. They already have their terminal there, why would mm-hmm. we want to get a new one? So this one kind of solves that problem and allows you to just touch your phone against their existing terminal. Um, so interesting here. Um, I sure. Don't know. It's an interesting video. Look it up. I, I don't know if you noticed, but Jason Oxman wearing a bow tie. <laughs> Going to the second tweet. Second tweet, we have Joseph Weisenthal at the stalwart. Every item on this 1991 Radio Shack flyer was made obsolete by the smartphone. He has a picture of the flyer. Uh, this is this. Is, we talked about this at the beginning of the show. Tell the, tell the listeners some of the things on here. Uh, it if looks like we've got a, a ham radio of some sort. Uh, we've got a, a home phone, a corded phone, a tape recorder, five hundred pound computer. Yeah, I don't, that's that computer could could kill an ox. Uh, a camcorder. Uh, I, I mean, there's so all obsolete. Do you have any of these items? C- in your CD house? player. CD player. Remember Do those things. I have a, I mean, in terms of a computer, I have a laptop mm. at home, but I mean, that that's not quite the same Do you have an actual thing. PC? No. I, 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 live in, I, I live in a 575 square foot apartment. There's no room for a PC. That's your problem. There's literally no room for a PC. Third tweet. Third tweet of the day. This is from Diana Olick. She says, 40% of fourth quarter home sales were all cash in 2013, up from 25% in 2012. 2013, also first year home equity lending increased since 2006. I'm surprised by the all cash deals were actually higher in 2013 than, than 2012 when we've seen some of the big cash buyers like Blackstone mm-hmm. back off a little bit. Were you surprised by that? I was, I was, and, what, and we, we've talked about this being a tough market for banks to operate in, and that continues to show it. I, 
so with so much of the real estate market happening in all cash deals, that means that people aren't borrowing to get mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Next tweet. This comes from Matthew C. Klein, at MC Klein. Thank the insurers. They're going to give us robots and then they are going to die. This is from, uh, links out to FT Alphaville. David, this is an article about robots and the insurance industry. Insurers are embracing uh, technology in order to get better data on drivers, mm -hmm. for instance. And this better data hopefully will lead to better underwriting profits, better data, better underwriting profits for the insurers. The problem is, is that that can help bring premiums down. And as premiums come down, as competition increases, as the data gets better, that's bad potentially in the long run for insurers because they make money two ways. One is underwriting profitably. Two is by taking the premiums that they're holding and investing them. Yep. So if you're taking in lower premiums, even if you've got better data that's driving those premiums, you're investing less, you're making less money on that, and that's bad. And it's even worse because most insurers tend not to underwrite profitably. Yep. And I don't think that that's necessarily just a data thing. It's a competition thing. It's a lack of, of uh, being able to, to have the, I don't know, the, the ability to not write business yeah. that isn't gonna work out of Robots or not, there will still be insurers that write bad policies. I don't care, right. I mean, we've seen people come out and say, there's gonna be driverless cars, you're not gonna need insurance anymore. You're still gonna need it, and there's still gonna be people very bad at writing it. We, there's you, always gonna be good people writing it. You were talking about the competitive advantage of Berkshire's Geico yesterday, that will continue to be a competitive advantage even in the age of the robots that they have the discipline yeah. to underwrite profitably. For sure. All right, final tweet of the day. Going over to the Huffington Post, they say, it's National Pancake Day. Are you a fan of pancakes? Did you know it was National Pancake Day? No. I had no I had no idea. I am I'm a big I'm a pretty big fan of pancakes. Those look pretty good. Yeah, they look wonderful. I, I'm a runner. I love carbs. Mm. I, I instead of eating a gluten-free diet, I basically eat a gluten diet. Uh, you extract the, the gluten out of everything. Basically. Shoot it in. <laughs> the one thing that annoys me more than anything else, though, when it comes to pancakes, is when you order blueberry pancakes, and they come as a stack of regular pancakes oh. with some blueberries dumped on top. <laughs> that is that the is worst. Just Literally poor the worst. effort. It is poor just effort. stick it in the batter. It's you gotta, you gotta get it. But if you only have the blueberry compote, you can't put blueberry. Is that your go-to pancake, the blueberry pancake? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. What about you? Chocolate chip. Of course, of course. All right, that's the show for today. I'm Matt Kobenever. This is David Hansen. We're on Twitter, at TMF Financials. If you're not already listening to this on podcast, find us on iTunes. Give us a rating. We love to hear what you have to say. We'll see you tomorrow. People on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. Don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear.